Welcome to another episode of the Bandwagon Podcast. And today I've been joined by a very special guest, uh, somebody I tried to get on earlier and I have put my hands up and I will say sorry more formally. Um, she is an award-winning uh, dis- uh, disability specialist and the UK's most influential disabled person. Um, in 2020, she was named in the top 100 women uh, uh, BBC list. And without further ado, welcome to Shani Dander. Hi. Hi, how are you? Sorry, uh, I, did, I did say in the intro about the apology. I, I will disclose at this point, I w- we were supposed to do this a few weeks back or probably a month or two back and uh, I agreed to a date time to get this done and I completely forgot and um, it was one of those oh my god I'm not you know when you get one of those things where I'm supposed to be doing something today I forgot <laughs> yeah and um, I feel like that all the time by the way and it's fine don't worry it happens to all of us yeah I'm, I'm not you know what it is I think I'm such a stickler for time that if you're on time you're late in my opinion and I've always been brought like my baby and my mom and dad, and my mom especially, brought 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 me up to say time is time. You value it, you value it. So like um, even at work, I'll say to my team, I was like, we've got to be ahead of schedule, ahead of schedule. Um, and so when when I kind of actually violate my own rule, I feel mm-hmm. uh, you know I feel, I feel ashamed. I feel like an outcast. But it wasn't intentional. It's fine. Yeah. Don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah, yeah. How are you anyway? So, how is the? Uh, I mean, it's been a bit. I'm, I'm, I mean, we're recording this only uh, the day before of what's happened with the Siddu Musiala as well. So, uh, it's been, it's been a quite emotion, emotional thing. Has that had an impact on on yourself in terms of uh, this morning or yesterday? Yeah, I mean, it was a real shock, wasn't it? When I first saw the news on Instagram, I went to go and check some of the sources. Like, is this true? Oh, uh, you know, oh, I was hoping it wasn't. Um, I have to admit, I'm not a big Bhangra head. Mm. If, if you go onto my Spotify, you will not find any Bhangra <laughs> in my playlist. However, I really appreciate it. I love it at a wedding, oh. you know. Um, and I, I think what's really sad is that when we are seeing people use their platform to create societal change, they're getting murdered for it. Mm. We know how corrupt some places are in the world, um, and it's shocking now. This is one of many. Uh, you know, it's a long line of people, and it's it's really sad. But I was also reflecting on the legacy that he's created as well at such a young age, um, which is incredible. So, yeah, I mean, I was at them. Um... I mean, I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm going to do a dedic. It, it would have already been out by then, but um, I, I, I was going to kind of, I was do, planning on, I was just reflecting and processing. I was with my, I was at my son's um, friend's birthday party. And you know, your community centre, you got a bouncy castle, you know, everyone's been dragged yeah. to one or something. And um, I had no reception and it, my, his friend's dad actually got a message on there. And I'm, it, I know it's significant, you know, when you have certain things that you remember where you were. And I was like, I remember yeah. where I was. And I thought, oh, oh. And then in the car, I was sitting there and then I didn't know what my surroundings were. And so my son heard that he, he's been killed. He's dead. And I was like, mm-hmm. he's five. And I was mm-hmm. like, all of a sudden, there's this kind of, you know, I don't, I don't put on any of the Ukraine stuff. I don't put on any of the COVID stuff. Mm-hmm. He's on TV. You're, you're really aware of, of your kind of surroundings. And, and, He's five, and the impact that he's kind of grown up with Siddu, like in the background, yeah. and you think, uh oh, and so this is like their generation's Jamkila and or who, whatever you know, uh, what kind of cultural significance. Mm. And I think when you've got somebody who can transcend different kind of genres, in different kind of even areas of work, I think it says a uh, it says a lot about that person in terms of kind of yeah. legacy. And I you think know what else I yeah. noticed. Um, so many parents saying because of Siddhu, their kids can speak Punjabi. Yeah. <sighs> you know, and well, my parents sent me to Punjabi school. They forced me to do GCSE in it. Of course, I hated it at the time. I hated spending my entire weekend learning Punjabi. But as an adult, I am so grateful for the fact that not only can I speak it, but I can read and write Punjabi as mm. well. Mm. It's a skill that 
I will have forever. Mm. The fact that through music, Siddha was able to do that in a generation that is so much more harder to reach, I think is something incredible. And when I was talking about legacy earlier, it's way more than just his music. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's still very raw, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think I think I think that's the word raw in it. So I mean, I don't really want to dwell on it too much is about you really so um but in, ter- in terms of um you know we, ju- we were just talking about legacy and then when I, I when I was doing my kind of research into yourself and and looking at the kind of the work that you were doing you know you, you you've definitely created a, and have a kind of body of work or a, a portfolio of work that you've kind of crossed areas like in in tech um or within your own line of business or your day to day as a as a champion, an inclusive kind of champion uh, as well. You know, on various kind of platforms. You know, how does a young shiny get into um, a uh, into that kind of arena? I have to start by saying I never planned any of this. I never planned to do the work that I'm doing. I never planned to be an entrepreneur. I never planned to be an activist. It's all just happened very organically. So I was born with a really rare genetic condition. It's called brittle bone disease. Um, and I have a short stature as a result of it. So I'm three foot 10 in height. That's about the height of a four year old. Um, and so when I was born, it was a really tough time for my parents because I didn't actually get a diagnosis until I was two years old. So as soon as I was born, the doctors told my parents, there's something that's not quite right, but we're not sure what it is. Uh, take her home we'll figure it out and get back to you and then um, my parents had to go to Great Ormond Street and I just want to pause here and say you know for them to go to London on a train go in a black cab it was a really big deal back then for them all they knew was West Brom you know my parents are literally in the same jobs that they did when I was born that's how that's what their world was so even doing that going to London to the hospital was a really it was a really big thing um but I'm really glad they did do that that's where I got my uh, diagnosis and even then they didn't really get the answers that they were looking for because the condition's quite rare it only affects one in 15,000 people in the UK and you know my parents were asking questions you know will she ever be able to walk will she ever ever be able to do x y and z and the doctors were just sort of like we don't know we can tell you you know um what life is typically like for people that live with this condition but essentially when you have brittle bone disease it's like being made out of glass so my bones break without any trauma I don't have to have an accident. I don't have to have an injury. I don't have to fall over in order for my bones to break. So I could probably write a really brilliant book on all the ways I've broken. Um, But I'm also incredibly lucky. So I've only ever had six breaks in my life. But people with my condition and the type of brutal bones that I have actually break between three to 400 times in their life. It's like coughing and then breaking a rib that's how brittle some people are um so my childhood was very um unpredictable I would just break so you, I, d- I wouldn't know when okay so I'm just trying to I'm just, I'm because I've broken I've broken my yeah. um ankle and I've broken my wrist yeah yeah and this might be the most stupidest question that I ever ask ever but in terms of the kind of break and the pain, is the pain any different because of the text? I mean, you wouldn't have anything to compare about, but what I'm just saying is like the pain for somebody who's breaking it for like three, 400 times, mm. you know, that, I mean, it's excruciating to do that. When you do it, where you're feeling exactly the same kind of amount of pain as somebody who's classed as not having the disease. Um, so when I'm, when I don't have any broken bones, I'm always in pain anyway. Right. Because I've got this condition, I've got many other conditions as well. So uh, 
if you ever asked me to tell you a day that I wasn't in pain, I can't. Like, my earliest memory is just pain. Um, but that's now, like, my baseline, if that makes sense. So, and all my breaks have been major breaks. I've always broken my legs. So it wasn't like a finger here and a toe there. It was always my legs. So by the age of 14, I had broken my legs six times. And I I knew when my legs would be broken. Let me tell you, like, what would happen. So um, <laughs> once, okay, I was on a family holiday in Canada and a relative, you know how you pick a child up from <laughs> under the arm? And they threw them over the No. <laughs> Could you pick okay. me up to carry me and my leg broke my leg wasn't hurting no one touched my leg but that that's how my bones used to break and I mean that, what did he say what did he say she was destroyed she, oh, she, she was she felt guilty and then you know obviously we were trying to say it's not your fault it's just what happens she doesn't live in this country she lives in Canada so we're probably very new to it all but it was the last day of our holiday and my mum was a blesser. She had to make a really tough decision. Um, I'm one of three, so I've got an older sister and a younger brother. And it was a summer holiday. I always used to break in the summer holidays. It used to annoy me because like, I couldn't miss that much school then, could I? No, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so my mum basically drugged me up, bandaged my leg up and flew me home because... Uh, because I, I can't get travel insurance to cover me basically um and if I'd stayed in Canada we would have been there for six months mm. it would have meant my sister may not have been able to do her GCSEs it would have meant my mum wouldn't have been able to work for six months mm. and I still don't know to this day how we did that you know you know when I look back on this time in my life I sometimes think did that happen to me <laughs> did all these things happen to me um so yeah uh so I would know without needing an x-ray when my bone was broken um and my mom never once called an ambulance you know even when we lived only around the corner from the hospital even when I was in pain she'd be like somebody needs that more than you so she'd just pick me up put me in the car and we'd go down to Amy so the reason, like, I have the strength that I have today is massively because of my mum's influence. She never treated me any differently from my siblings. I got shifted. I was probably, like, the cheekiest child out of all of us. I think because I couldn't do physical alpha. I couldn't do, I couldn't, you yeah. know, do physical, I couldn't be mischievous physically. So it was all in my mouth. <laughs> You over, you over, you overcompensate on being the cheeky one. Yeah, Probably. I'll get you. Yeah, but um, I have that same relationship with being fat. So I am, <laughs> so because I can't, <laughs> I'm just do it for that. So, but I, I'm just thinking. Imagine like the, imagine if the blame claim culture was around for you. Like you know, someone picked you, you broke your leg, or I put a claim in there. You'd be a bloody multi millionaire just to start. Off. In America, but like I knew. Um, there was like a, a time where I would have got taken into care because mm. especially without a diagnosis um, and I was getting all these injuries, my mum was asked, you know, are you abusing this child? And I know people with my condition that did wrongly get put into care. The fact that I didn't, you know, I'm very grateful for. Yeah. But having a diagnosis is a privilege and that's not something that I really, um, really uh understood until I got COVID because when I present myself to medical professionals like I am a medical amazement to them because they will never have met anybody with my condition so that, that maybe they will have read about it but quite often a lot of people don't know about it so uh, once I went to a and &E, um and the consultant was amazed that I was there I was there with a broken leg and you know the whites the whites of your eye, um, when you've got a white of bronze, they're usually blue. And when I break, they go blue. And so he was calling every time Dick and Harry into the queue, we got to look at my eyes. And I was lying there in pain. I was like, can you please give me some pain relief? But so, yeah, like even my GP doesn't really know what to do with me. So when <laughs> I presented with brittle bones and COVID, two very unknown conditions, 
people were like, what do we do with you now? So yeah. it wasn't until I had COVID did I really understand the privilege of a diagnosis. That's crazy. Because then even with, I mean, we do live in a bit of more kind of a labelistic uh, culture nowadays and society where some people either they get given a, a label, then they conform to that label. And, but like, mm. I, I don't feel when you you live to that you kind of you're creating you're kind of a trailblazer in your own in your own way because it's uncharted territory for a, a lot of these people and then they they kind of picked out it, just going I mean you touched on um, you know a little bit of your childhood and then what what are these some of the other barriers that you faced was there anything around I mean physically to get to school would have been even mm. more scary as well. So I actually went to a special needs primary school because that's what education was back 30 odd years ago. And it wasn't until I went to a mainstream secondary school did I myself realise that that wasn't the best place for my learning. I was amongst severely disabled children. I would feed them their crisps at lunch because there people wouldn't be able to do that for themselves don't get me wrong I absolutely loved it I loved my time there loved the school there played loads I remember the teachers telling me that I'd read all the books in the school um and yeah it wasn't until I went to secondary school I was like oh I don't know anything I did I felt like I didn't know the basics and then on top of that because of how much recovery I would need after breaking I'd missed loads of school as well because it was it was during yeah primary secondary school I had the majority of my breaks and when when I broke it would be months on like traction pulling the bone back into place then I'd have to have physio then I'd have to learn how to walk again then I'd be able to go home so I'm talking about a good six months of mm-hmm. recovery each time um so I think I think it's sad really like I don't think inclusion in education has changed that much it's better than what it was but I was put in a system that I think held me back on one hand yes it 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 was the right place for my physical needs at the time but I didn't have anything special I used a wheelchair But there are so many other children that use wheelchairs that also go to a mainstream primary school as well. Um, But I think it was to do with the age, the condition, not knowing so much about it. So I'm not I'm not saying, you know, oh, I'll hold everyone to account and everyone about everyone was bad for choosing this decision for me. It just is what it is. Um, Yeah. So when I went to secondary school, yeah, I felt like I didn't know the basics. I remember coming home and asking my mum for a tutor. What child asks for a tutor? I normally you get sent to tuition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I was really proud. Of, uh, I left uh, school with 11 GCSEs. But if I'm being truthfully honest, I was really infantilised, uh, even when I was, um, you know, a young person. So, you know, that, that age between, like, 14 to 18 and then 18 to early 20s my my family and the community would just treat me like a child they didn't understand how to treat me as a young adult or as a young woman so it was a physical um, it was a physical stereotype rather than the actual the the kind of mental kind of stereotype is that fair to say or not sort of because people also had massively low expectations for me in my life I'd remember so if I wasn't at home and if I wasn't in hospital we would be at the Godwara these was and and if I wasn't at school those are the only four places that we went as a family I all my family are Amrit Dari that's the family that I've that's all I've ever known my entire life um so the Godwara and the community were a really big role in my life and always have been and what I noticed was is the same expectations people had for other people my age, perhaps their children or other kids in the community, they didn't have that for me. I'm very capable of doing these things, but it's just like, oh, you don't have to do that, do you? Or you don't have to work, do you? You can just live on benefits. I was like, I don't want to do that, do I? I want to contribute to society. Um, 
even like when I was learning how to drive, people were falling off their chair with amazement. And I think it's just because our perception of disability generally in society is quite negative. And then it's even more negative in the South Asian community. If you ask me, the perception of disability is that either you're a benefit cheat or, or you want to be a Paralympian. That's all anyone ever thinks about disability because there's no other portrayal of it. Yeah, I, I mean, it was one of the, you just kind of answered the question, really. I was going to go and ask the, you know, the relationship between the faith, the the mm. representation and the, and the community would have been, you know, one of where you've managed again in different arenas and different settings. Everything you're, you're saying is a day-to-day kind of achievement from what you said. Like, I mean, I'll recommend anyone who's watching or listening to this is to follow your Instagram account and you're seeing daily challenges all the, all the time. Um, mm. I remember breaking my, I was talking about breaking my leg and I went to school and I had crutches. Mm. And when you're on crutches, you absolutely re- appreciate a handrail <laughs> for one <laughs> and a, a lift and an escalator or anything like that um you know and getting into a bath mm. getting into you know some of the most basic kind of day-to-day jobs and you and there was a sense of achievement but you're beating these things on a day-to-day basis from there how big of a challenge was it then when you were combating and had uh, combating some of those beliefs that were you were getting treated in that way were you firing back and saying, um, being like this, because, you know, you, you, you're very tenacious. I mean, would, would they take it in the right way when you were trying to give them that positive? I, I kind of see the answer already. Yeah. So I'll let, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you carry on. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say I've, I've had to be an educator and my own advocate from a really young age. You know, my dad was born in India. My mum was born here in Birmingham both you know from the same community same religion but both with very different views in life because of where they were born so I had I had different approaches to parenting as well um and I had to deal with a lot not just uh, at home but in the community you know I've had people say to me you must have done something bad in your past life that's why you were born with this condition and I know and I fully understand that that's what some people's view is of sickie and disability personally I don't think it's that and I'm really enjoying this new narrative of parents of disabled children that are saying well actually I see it as God has given me this amazing servo to do it's not that my child did something bad in their past life and I think that's so powerful because at 16, people were saying this to me. I was like, well, am I supposed to feel guilty? Like, oh, what could I have done? And I'd sit there and be thinking about that. And that's not helpful. But um, I think, coming back to the point where I had to educate people, like at the Godwara, again, I'd be standing next to my mum and people would be asking my mum how I am when they fall fully well now, I can respond for myself. So it'd be like, hi, Sean need And I'd be like, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? And my mum would tell me off for being rude. But I'd say, no, mum, actually, they're being rude. They're ignoring the fact I'm standing right next to you. Um, so, yeah, I've always had to be an educator. And I would definitely say... All of the perceptions and things people perhaps thought I couldn't achieve definitely fueled me and motivated me. But it wasn't it wasn't just that. It was the fact that I knew how fragile life is. The first 16 years of my life, I never had a chance to think about what my adult life would look like. So when I left school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was so envious of all these people that knew what they wanted to be, knew what they wanted to study. I never got that chance. It was literally focusing on break after break after break, learning how to walk again. And I just thought, well, this will be my life on me. And it wasn't until I had some surgery uh, to have some metal rods in my legs did my legs stop breaking. Um, So then suddenly the world is my oyster. 
stopped using a wheelchair at this age as well, full time. And I was like, what what do I do now then? Uh, So yeah, that was the time where I faced other barriers, societal barriers, because up, up until that age, I was in this safety net of education, family, um so that age it that I always talk about this but this age between like 16 and my early 20s it was really hard and also going on at home where my family were expecting me to take my umrah to become a baptized Sikh mm. and I didn't want to do it mm. but for them that was a really big deal they couldn't understand why I didn't want to they were like this is all you've ever known this is how we raised you your sister did it at 14, why aren't you doing it now? So to my family, they saw that as an act of rebellion or as an act of me being bad or naughty, when it isn't, because whatever I choose to do in my life and whatever choices I make about religion is only down to me. Mm. But for them, uh, I think they found that really hard. Mm. So there was lots going on at that time. Yeah, I mean, it's it sounds like I mean, I'm trying to unpick different layers of that. There's yeah. ex- family expectation. There's loyalty. There's your uh, somebody with a disability. You're a woman of color. All of these, all these little, um, uh, you know, challenges to kind of overcome to have a cumulative effect of a bigger change in it. Um, yeah. I just want to go back on something because there might be somebody who's listening to this or watching this who might have some similar going on or, or know of somebody around the world, wherever. In terms of kind of treatment wise, you mentioned that having rods and stuff and that has treatment evolved over uh, over over your lifetime in terms of that. Um, um, and what are the the um, what does uh, what does the future look like for them? Yeah, thank you for doing that. No one's ever done that before. I think it's really important because. I wouldn't be able to live the quality of life that I live now without that treatment, without the surgery, without the medical inve- intervention, basically without the NHS. Mm. I'm super, super grateful for the NHS. Um, and it's really sad to see what's happening with it at the moment. Um, so there's no cure for the condition. It's a genetic condition. And although it doesn't run in my family, um, I'm what they call a spontaneous mutation so there's just a chance of it happening to anybody anyway very very I think I think don't quote me I think it's like a one in a million chance could happen to anyone I think um, so I had um, yeah I had wadding surgery in my legs so because I only ever used to break my legs and then when they used to heal they'd be weaker and weaker each time and eventually the bone was so bowed that it was just only ever going to keep breaking. Um, and then I also had some treatment to strengthen my bone density. So now my bone density is average to anybody else's. And this drug that I had, it actually derived from a pipe cleaner. And I know it sounds <laughs> terrible, but essentially it helps the calcium stick to the bone because people with my condition have weak bones because there's holes in our bones, essentially. Mm. We don't have strong bones because of a collagen defect. Um, so, you know, when the COVID vaccine came out, I had no hesitation. I like, I've had everything in me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I never questioned anything when I was growing up. The, the drug that I had, obviously, it was very new at the time. And I really... I, I asked my mum this, I was like, weren't you scared that it could have gone wrong? She's like, yeah, but we just took the chance. And I'm really glad she did because it really helped. Oh, and the best thing was is I used to grow one centimetre every three months when I was on this drug. And I didn't know that that was going to happen, but it was just like a, a nice <laughs> positive yeah. side effect. Yeah, I, I think, and you know something, it's, I'm, 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 I'm using kind of, um my, my experience and, and my children's experience as I'm living it now because we've got like a height chart uh, you know in the hallway and it's a big um, deal isn't it growing it's massive, isn't it? It's, it, and it's massive and my, my son he's he's not um 
there's other kids. And I was just talking about on Saturday where he's joined like the next level of uh, footballers. And, and so he's like five and he's playing like seven year olds. Yeah. And then, you know, my own like guilt coming in that was like, he's not the tall, the tallest within there. And you see other kids from it, from that side. And then yeah. the discrimination language that I use on a dinner table, like, I'll eat your food and then you'll grow or you have your, have, have your milk. And I'm like, it's when you speak to someone like yourself, it's that self-education. Like, shit, man, I'm not even using the right terminology. There's this, <laughs> and like, yeah. it's, it's one of the worst things to do with this podcast is that you end up turning into this kind of super liberal woke, whatever. Are you very, <laughs> you're very, much no, no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that you're scared to bloody say it. Like, to, no, you, I get what you, mean. you and, I think it just, I think that just reflects the world that we live in yeah. and all of the unheard voices that there are within mm. our community. I think that's what it is. And I think that's why we've got this narrative of, oh, it's woke, it's this, it's that. It's not. It's just actually we're choosing to, to not exclude certain people anymore. Yeah. And through the power of podcasts and social media, diverse people are using that platform to get out their messages and their their lived experience and I don't think that's a bad thing in fact I think it helps us to become better citizens of the world to treat people more fairly mm. and I think if anyone thinks that that's a bad thing then you're weird no I, no I, no I 100% agree with you I think it's scared that you I think it's kind of scary in terms of that you're not um I'll give you another example. This is a weird, this is a, not a weird one, but like, yeah, it's weird for me, but it, <laughs> it, it, it's pathetic for everyone, everyone else. But like yesterday, I took my son to um, watch it. I do have a daughter and, and her name's Sean. So like, when you say Shani, I'm like, oh, God, that's what I, so she was at a party and I, I took him to the, to the football and um, he know, one of the players there, they've got twins and their daughters go are in his class. So they spotted each other and they, you know, like in a Melanie, they're, they're running to each other, hugging each oh. other. And like, they were their granddad and I'm like talking to her. And I was like, oh my God, like that would never happen when I was, you know, with mm. anyone at school. It'd always be like, oh, there's the smelly girls or whatever like this. And it's just, but you can see a new culture, a new atmosphere, mm. a new sense of education and and like a, a new, a new kind of unity. It feels like, especially with kids mm. growing up and, I feel a little bit of an anomaly at a generation where, like, at school, yeah. all the upper used to hang around the upper and then and, and, and there used to be the white crews used to hang around the white crews. And, like, now you see the di- how much diversity is there with people with their group of friends and stuff. And you can see yeah. they're really kind of enjoying it. And, and I think, you know, stories like yourself, and, and I don't really want to call it a story, really. It's the achievements, what you've done, not just in this bit. We're only just focusing on one area, really, like your yeah. physical disability. But your academia and the tech stuff I just want to go a little bit into that then mm. you know you, you you came out you came out with strong education then you you, you so the, I was when I was uh, researching you you applied for over a hundred jobs because you thought you were being courteous by writing on the application that you ha- that you had a condition and yeah. nobody got back to you until yeah. you took that out and put that put that in there um yeah. how then do you think okay the question is if you did that now would you still do that now I think oh that's a good question I think now times have changed and the way in which you apply for jobs have changed you've got to remember I always find like entry-level part-time jobs those kind of jobs, sometimes you apply for them informally, you go in and you drop your CV off. And of course, people get to see who you are and what you look like, right? Um, but that wasn't always the case either. So I'd love to sit here and say, yeah, it's different. But there are other disabled people that are more highly educated and more qualified than me that still have not had a chance of employment because of this stigma that exists. So. Yeah, essentially, I, I, when I think back at this time now, I think it just goes to show how naive I was. Like, I didn't I didn't realise there was so much stigma in the world against disabled people because, essentially, people were judging my ability, either on my appearance or the fact that I, I live with a condition. 
that's so sad when that is going to be the majority of us one day. Because 80% of all disabled people acquired their condition. They were not born with it. Mm. 80%. That means that disability is something that's going to affect all of us, whether it's directly, like you've already broken your bone, so you know what it feels like um, to be temporarily disabled, whether we get to reach old age, whether it's a loved one. So um, that's what actually gave me the mindset that I have today is that shit I can't get a job I wanted to work I had 11 GCSEs I got good grades as well Uh, you know I had all the enthusiasm to want to work but I just wasn't getting an opportunity so I thought right I cannot spend the rest of my life waiting on other people to give me an opportunity I have to create my own I had already felt on the back foot with my education. And if I'm being honest, that, that's how I've always felt throughout my life. I've always had to overcompensate. And that's why I, I felt like I had to go to university to have a degree to fall back on. Because I'm not academic. As I said, you know, I really struggled at school. I missed loads of school. I, I, I didn't have the best opportunities to get the best education. So going to uni, you know, I have a lot of older cousins. So when I was younger... Yeah, your crew's big, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I saw all my cousins going off to uni. And it was like what everyone aspired to do back then. And no one ever spoke to me about doing that. And therefore, I just never thought that would I'd ever be able to do it. And you know what? I thought only clever people went to uni until I got there and I realised it's yeah. just about handing you working on time. <laughs> Nothing yeah. about being clever. So, yeah, that's where this all came from. So I went to uni. I did a degree in event management. Again, I just chose something that I enjoyed. And that was after going to college. Um and I chose that because I, the person in my family, I planned the holidays, the parties, the get-togethers. And I thought, oh, that's fun. I'll do that. But what I didn't know is that I was choosing something that was so suited to my skill set because I live in a world that isn't designed for me. I literally have to think about how I'm going to reach my kitchen cupboards, how I'm going to buy and wear clothes because I can't just wear them after off the rail. I have to plan every bit of my life. So. Being an event and project manager is about planning. It's about problem solving. It's about knowing what to do in a crisis. That's been my entire life. So I spent 10 years doing that. And then um, slowly I was becoming a budding disability activist. And it was because of this lack of representation that I was seeing in the conversation of inclusion and disability. Um, And I just thought, well, hang on. South Asian community is the second largest population. Why am I just seeing old white men make decisions on behalf of my community? They don't have any idea of what it's like to be a South Asian woman and Mm. and live as a disabled person. And you know what also strikes me is that as South Asians, we are highly regarded for our contribution to to modern British society, whether that's in politics, medicine or sport. We, we, we're, we're a well-educated community, but then why are we so behind on something like disability? Why is it still a taboo? So that's yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, to I mean, I'll throw it back to you. Why do you think it's still a taboo? I think it's a very layered answer definitely religion has a role to do in it definitely culture and these two things are very intrinsic to the to how we live our lives right Mm. culture and religion is central to who we are and what we do whether we believe in god or not um also generational views that get passed down so as i said my mum was born here but sometimes with the things that she says i sometimes think why do you think that? And it's because that's what her parents taught her who were born in India. And then all these views get passed down. So we are the generation of, uh, of cycle breakers, aren't we? Yeah. We're the ones that are challenging that, changing that, and hopefully have made it easier for the next generation to, 
to continue doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, yeah. Um, I think with any kind of stigma, those conversations that need to kind of happen is they formulate on like honesty, trust and, and, and you know, the ingredients of a cake, I kind of put it down. But sometimes the topic area is that, you know, to come in and when you're challenging, um, mm. it's kind of, it's learned behavior. So I think we've got that duty, you know, to kind of have that education um, yeah. to making sure that you're passing down the correct information. So can people can make an informed choice, not just any choice, but an informed choice yeah. is, is huge. And we also have this, huge concept of honour and shame in our community honour in terms of holding up a status or your family's reputation and shame in you know what will people say what will people think and I don't know why but always from a young age I I guess I've never cared about what other people think because I think if I ever did I wouldn't leave my front door you know, like yeah. people harass me in the street. That's the norm. People troll me online. That's the norm. Just because of who I am and how I look and because of all the things that make me who I am. So if I really cared about other people, I wouldn't have the confidence to do any of what I'm doing. So, and you know, that that's how things like the Asian Woman Festival come about, the Asian uh, Disability Network, is because... I've had a lifetime of fighting barriers, changing attitudes and mixing that in with my events background. It was a really natural thing to do because I would I was looking for these communities, but they didn't exist. So I just created these safe spaces. And, you know, when I did the first Asian Woman Festival, I thought, I'll just do the first one and I'll see how it goes. We're now a community of over 30,000 across 38 countries. So... It wasn't just me that was craving for that. It was many other people mm-hmm. too. So, so how, how did you, you know, the events, the events uh, management side of stuff and, and you go into that, was then was there like a natural progression to get into the media or when, when did you mm-hmm. notice that there was that, that, that gap? Not really. And um, I, I hate public speaking, if I'm being honest. If you watch my TED Talk, You'll, you'll understand why. No, I wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, I hated it. I hated it. And as an event manager, you would be the person that would have to open the event, introduce the speaker, thank the attendees for I hated it. Oh, I, I hated it. But I think it just goes to show that when you align your purpose with your passion and your work, suddenly things that you hated, you love and really enjoy or can enjoy. Mm. Um. So no, actually, it was when I just started sharing my experience more. um, So I got involved in a charity called Scope. They're a pan-disability charity in the UK. Uh, I've had a really long relationship with them and I'm now an ambassador for the charity. It was there where I really got to share the reality of being a South Asian woman who experiences disability. And you've, you've got to understand, like, I was in my late 20s at this point. And no one had ever been interested in this narrative. No one had ever been interested in this intersectional lens either of what my life was actually like. But I wasn't doing it to say, oh, my life is this, my life is that. I was doing it because I want to make change. So that's where it all started, really. Um, I That's where, like, this activism started through getting involved with scope and they nurtured that in me very coincidentally I didn't go to them and say oh I want to be this and I want to go on tv nothing like that it's just like it just helped build my confidence in it it got me to understand like that people actually needed to hear what I was saying because nobody else was there was no other narrative of of somebody with my lived experience um so that's how that all started um and uh, as I said earlier I never planned any of this this has all come as a result of the work that I do so I'm, I'm a consultant I work with businesses and brands and I help them to become more inclusive but also because I am an activist and I speak on behalf of the community um 
so yeah that's how that all yeah and, out. and just from the t- the, t- the tech side I know you were in development of doing the uh, doing the app did that come oh. did, did, uh, how, what stage are we now in what iteration are we with that now so I'm launching a discount platform for disabled people because life costs a lot more when you live with a conditional impairment and I actually had the idea when I was at uni myself um, I had had a whole life of experiencing extra costs and feeling the guilt of my parents paying for my extra costs in order for me to go to secondary school I needed an electric wheelchair that cost seven thousand pounds seven thousand pounds back then and I sat there thinking that could have been the cost of like the next family car. Mm-hmm. I felt so guilty that my family had to, my parents who'd worked so hard and who are still in the same manual labor job that they were in back then had to spend all that money just for me to go to school. Um, so I thought, well, this isn't fair. Why do students get a discount when disabled people probably need it more? But back then when I was at uni, no one was talking about disability it wasn't trendy we hadn't had the uh, the 2012 Paralympics because that helped to really shift perception in society Mm. um so I waited a couple of years and that's when I got going and at the point where I got investment then the pandemic hit and I lost all my investors um uh so yeah we're a couple of months off launch it's another long story probably a whole different episode about yeah that. yeah no when that launches we'll get yeah. you we'll get you back on and uh, just to give it give it a yeah, good yeah but um again i'm not from a tech background i can't even use a mac but i made a promise say, I myself, can't as well. <laughs> right? i'm a windows girl through and through but i made a promise to myself ricky that my worst fear is to be alive and not live my worst fear is to live with regret. I know how fragile life is. Like, look at how the first 16 years of my life were. I'm very aware that these years that I have now are the years where I will have the most mobility, the most independence and the most freedom, which is why I travel so much, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I know as I get older, I will use a wheelchair again. I will have reduced mobility and not that those are bad things but I'm just very aware of the fact that life is going to be harder because the world is inaccessible it's not because I live with this condition it's because of the way the world is set up so yeah I'm just doing me well that's I mean like if anybody needs any kind of motivation just listen to the last minute of that I'm definitely going to clip that so I'm giving you that (laughs) I'll give you that (laughs) Oh, just and and you know you you've been a very consistent voice you know when you when you've talked about us and you've appeared on some of the kind of like loose women you've been on this morning um did I hear or miss did, did you get into some acting at all as well I did I love me standards and I got to be me standards <laughs> so you. you went to the now I'll be honest I haven't watched yes. it for a long time it's amazing, and there's even a Sikh family in there now. You've got to watch it. Yeah, Sikh I saw when that, the and they were the last time when I saw when it that when the, is he a gangster? Because I think the the first yeah. time when I saw when he when the, when they announced that they were coming, I said, "Oh yeah, that's good." I gave it a retweet, and then the mm-hmm. typical thing, and you know, just retweet it. Yeah, well done. And then I didn't pay any attention. So, are you <laughs> are you part of that family then? I wish I was. Oh. I wish I want to be Keelan's girlfriend in there, right? But no, I'm not. I was an estate agent. It was just a guest role. Okay. Um, yeah. And look, I'm not an actress. I just had the opportunity to audition for it. And I went for it purely because I just wanted to go to Albert Square. I didn't think I'd get it. I got it. Um, so, yeah, that's. Was that's it like, a, what was it like? Do you, did they write, how did you know that opportunity was there to act like that, that role was coming up? Uh, so my, I've got an agent, and they sent it to me. They knew I looked. Oh, look at you got that agent. Look at that. <laughs> look how far you've gone. You've gone from you know being at the Gordala, <laughs> and, you, and your mum was the agent there speaking on your behalf, and now you've got a proper agent speaking on your behalf. A female. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I'll never forget who I am and where I'm from. Big yeah. up West Brom. Yeah, no, no, that I look. I am, look. All credit to you for. If I could get an agent, that'd be brilliant. So, um, when you go, when so you go there, and then they pick it, and then then what? What was Albert Square like then? 
Oh, it was amazing. It was it was just amazing just to see how it all comes together and how talented the people are. Like they don't have long to learn the lines and do what they need to do. And the first time they rehearse is the scene before it will get recorded. So yeah, it was a really big learning curve. But I much prefer just being who I am and saying what I want to say. It's very hard um, acting. So. What did you sell him? What were you, what uh, what oh, were you saying? My storyline. It was part of a. Re- it was part of a. Re- my scene was part of a really big storyline. I was selling somebody's house from underneath them. Um, so yeah, it was, you have to watch. And you, you knew and you knew you were doing that. So like, what I'm saying, were you an innocent or you a villain? It sounds like you're a bit of a villain. No. I wasn't a villain. I was just a sassy estate agent. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, because I watch it like religiously, you know what I love? Like, you know, when I've been on holiday, I love coming home, making the jar, and just binge watching the whole week of EastEnders episode. To me, that is pure bliss. I still think my mom and dad record it. See that like, all Coronation Street? There was that oh. once. Yeah, it's hilarious. Oh, fair. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's great. And then you went on Loose Women as well? Yes, yeah, so I'm a guest panellist. Are, are, reg- are you a regular on there now? So I'm a guest panellist, so I'm not, um, uh, like, a, re- a regular, but yeah. I, I guess, go when they call me. I want to be a regular. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's really great, and it's just like having a chat with your mates. Mm. Um, and they're really nice and super interested in my opinion and what I've got to say and I think that's the I think that's the key thing because even when you know when I follow, follow you on, on Instagram and when you actually say something it's always a different perspective I think that's really rare now because we can kind of you can see people just conforming to the same kind of narrative and uh, yeah. around it and I think you you are a very unique voice in a in a, in a just a unique set of circumstances as well so mm-hmm. Having a different angle will be kind of you know is the be- is, is really valuable. Yeah. What's you the know what, you, oh, know what um, you know when I first started out doing this, I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I'm representing disabled people. I'm representing Asian women, but actually, it it transcends all of that, and it's from the comments that I get old white men like they're like, wow, you know, you're so amazing, or what you said made so much sense to me I would never have understood this perspective before so I I take up space thinking I'm doing it for this community and this group of people but it it goes beyond that and I think that's the power in diversity and including different people in everything that we do I'm just gonna. I want to ask you a couple of final questions that we're getting there. So, like, in your next six months, are we going to see you in a film? What are we going? Is there a um, book coming out? Is there like a Shani on tour kind of thing? <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> no, there's a there's a few um things that I've contributed that are coming out soon. Is that um, the thing that you came? Okay, so just to be aware, you were on holiday. Was it in Vegas or something? Yeah. And then you cut it short for something else that you're working on. Are you allowed to say what that is yet? Yes, that's happened. So uh, I was invited to speak at Google for the third year in a row. Google, you know. So they must really like what I have to say. But yeah, um, so uh, my friends are still on holiday. I've got proper FOMO. Um, are they sending so, you yeah, dark in the WhatsApp group and it's sending you yeah. pictures up there? Yeah. This on holiday, I would have been there, but look, um, it was an amazing opportunity. When Google rings, you go. You don't say no to Google. And what um, are they are they doing particular kind of projects or are they just trying to highlight causes or it was um it was for their flagship advertising event of the year. So all of their clients that they work with, the world's biggest brands. So I was there to talk about um inclusive marketing um and, and help people on that journey. Um, but yeah, I love Google as a client. They're, they're amazing, and their stuff's brilliant. So yeah, so that's one. That's one exciting part of the, the work that I do. Is I, you know, get to work with amazing brands, and I get to, I get to work with the people that shape our society. You know, it's great going on TV. It's great being invited to glamorous events. But the core of my work is working with people that influence our society and for me that's 
why I started a business because it's not governments or charities that influence society it's business it's why the app that I'm launching isn't a charity because it has to be a business that otherwise we wouldn't have influencers who make tons of money right I'm actually you actually just re some you what you just said there's actually kind of um reinvigorated my belief i went to the podcast show man like there's a there's like a world event like the youtuber there everything mm. i looked around there was nobody like me there was no there was very few people of color that there in in total and i went to go and speak to one of the execs there and i was like oh how you doing you know blah 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 and i said oh you know what's your plans for like inclusion inclusion of diversity and stuff and he he started he goes yeah we've always got a plan you know we're happy to work with anyone uh, our core audience is america so like automatically assuming that we the podcast that is bilingual it's it's yeah. just not it's just not for them and i just thought oh man i feel like being starting at zero again but like yeah. when you hear stories like what you've just been invited in you know that is kind of reassuring and and you know moving in the right direction and what i would say there are so many um companies out there yet that still do not understand that by being diverse and inclusive it means that your productivity is going to be better and it means that your profitability is going to be better so don't don't waste your time with those organizations because there are other organizations that get it and that know that not only is this right, the right thing to do morally, but it also benefits us commercially as well. So I am really seeing that shift now. Yes, it's tough. Yes, it makes my work very repetitive. Yes, it's frustrating. And yes, it is emotionally exhausting. Um, but change is happening. So um, yeah. don't, don't give up. And no. just look for those companies that are putting their money where their mouth is okay last bit now so and um i'm not i'm not sure that you you've had to, you know in your showbiz life not, to, not to, to to listen to any of the episodes but i give an opportunity to the, to the guests at this point in to say that uh the show is called the bandwagon so um is there a bandwagon that you like to jump on is there a bandwagon that you like to jump off or generally, is there anything that you want to just get off your ch off your chest? So this is your opportunity to to kind of uh, share those feelings. Oh. Yeah, something that I want to get off my chest is so lots of people ask me, well, what can we do to make the world more inclusive, or what can we do to remove barriers for disabled people? And while I truly believe that yes we have a voice in that the onus is always on us to remove the barriers that we didn't put into place and it's really annoying because despite doing all the work that I'm doing I've got other dreams and ambitions but at this moment in time I never think I don't think I'll ever get around to doing that because there's still so much work to do in this space and with the person who I am I can't walk away from it either I'm like no you need to do this and this and this so what I want to say is don't expect an oppressed group or a marginalized community to remove the barriers that they didn't put in place everyone has a responsibility whether you are aware of it or not whether you work in a corporate space or not whether you no, it could be anywhere. It could be in your friend circle, your family circle, the Godzilla, the corner shop, the football team. In every walk of life, everyone has a responsibility. And it's just about helping people to live life, live life independently, confidently, and without barriers. And I think that's a basic need that we should all have the right to, to enjoy. So that's what I want to get off my chest. No, thank you, man. It's, it's, you know, when you, when you, Sometimes I give opportunity to some people and they'll, they'll say kind of the same kind of thing and you understand it. But like for you to actually kind of think about that and come to a, a more calculated response, you know, I really appreciate that. And I think we'll touch base again once when the app, when the app launches and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll give it a plug and to do everything. But um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out and uh, joining me on, on the episode. Really appreciate it. And uh, just, just to say that we'll support everything that you'll do. 
thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really glad we got to make this happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, see you later. Bye.